Hello everyone and welcome back to Small Time TV. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which Will and I are gathered here. Uh, we're all gathered here today. The Woiwurrung Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and give a very warm welcome to any First Nations people who are here with us today at Small Time and also streaming from wherever you may be. Thanks for tuning in. I'm super excited to welcome to the studio Will, Lanks, Lindsay, all the things. Mm -hmm. um, lots of names. Lots of names. Do you want to play a few songs for us? Sure. Yep. Straight Let's do in. it. Yeah. Webs out. That's your warm up? <coughs> yeah, it's wow. not a very sophisticated warm up. Just straight into the hardest, highest stuff, you know. I beg to differ. <laughs> okay, um, I'll play something else. Um, I might play this um, new, the new Lindsay song, actually. I'll just be one second retuning if everyone has a moment. 
I just noticed your new tattoo. Yeah. It's your grandmother's design. It is. It's from that EP, actually. Yeah. That, um, that last song. Does your grandmother know that you're inked with her design? She does. Um, I took it and showed it to her. I got it the day before I left Australia um, to move overseas. And, um, and I went the next morning, like the morning I was flying, and I went and showed it to her at like 7 a.m. She was half asleep and clearly like a bit shocked. Uh, she doesn't love tattoos, yep. even though she's designed one for my sister um, before. So uh, she was a bit shocked, but then when I got to America, like 30 hours later, there was this email from her that was like the sweetest email ever. And she was just like, I'm so blown away that you would get a tattoo of my work. And it's such a nice reminder that you'll always have of Australia. And so it was just lovely. She, she came around. Yeah. It's I beautiful. I think it didn't take a lot of time. Yeah. We've got a pretty good relationship because she does all my artwork. So. A plus for multitasking. I'm terrible at it. No, I was impressed. It's probably not in tune. I'll be quiet. Sorry. <laughs> okay, this song is called "Time to Go" um, for my yeah my Lindsay project, which is actually my middle name, named after my grandpa. So that my grandma's husband, yeah. Spend all your time on the weekend breaking up on me. Caught in the light of this distant memory. Put my phone back on the cradle. Feel like it could be my time to go. Drag myself from this sweet fable Feel like it could be my time to go 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 Feel like it could be my time to go Be my time to go Be my time to go Giving you space I'm lost without a trace And now I know Spend all your time But you're still on my mind And now I know Put my phone back on the cradle Feel like it could be my time to go Drag myself from this sweet fame Feel like I could spend some time alone Spend some time alone Spend some time alone Spend some time alone Feel like I could spend some time alone Spend some time alone Spend some time alone Drag my 
myself from this sweet fate Feel like I could spend some time Spend some time alone Spend some time alone Spend some time alone Feel like it could be my time to go Be my time to go Be my time to go Nice to be hanging out with you. Yeah. Last time I saw you, you were moving to Sydney. That's a while ago. Yeah. And then since then, you've relocated to New York. I have, yes. Were either of those moves for your musical career? No. They were both for my now wife. Okay. But that, that's fine. Like, I'm cool with it. It's yeah. pretty cool to be living in New York. I'm kind of, yeah, being, I don't know, it's a bit of a journey. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really mind. I kind of feel like I could live anywhere now. Yeah. Yeah. And sort of co did that, and that coincided with you taking a hiatus from playing and and yeah. performing lengths. Sort live. of. Yeah. I moved to Sydney, and then I think yeah, it's just a bit of a process of I didn't know where I was at with that project, and I wasn't feeling particularly inspired, and. I don't, know, I don't really like doing something unless I feel like a hundred percent in. Um, so I just put it on hold because I'd also made a collaborative record with like Dustin Tebbett and some other friends, Hayden Kalman and stuff. And we kind of took last year to release that while I was, yeah, while I was taking a break and I don't know, just like trying to rediscover why I was doing it in the first place, I guess. And that Not, was you know. the OK Moon, the collaborative yeah. Project, yeah. It was nice that like I went on hiatus, but I had like a huge pile of music ready to release. Yeah. So it wasn't like the worst wait. It's not like I had nothing ready and then I had to start from zero again. Yeah. It's more that I just, I did like a two years where I was writing like all the time. And then at the end of it, I was like, I'm, I'm empty. There's nothing left to say mm. and I'm boring. That's how I felt. But strangely, you were selling out shows everywhere putting music out and getting sort of millions of streams. Yeah, my career did better when I was on hiatus than when I was active, uh, which is weird. But it was kind of nice because it also, while I don't like building my confidence on like external validation, it does sometimes help to see that like people in all corners of the earth were listening to that EP, the one that I tattooed the artwork of. Like, yeah. It was like really nice to make something that I actually made a record that was like not at all really I made it for my friend who like was like fighting cancer at the time and everything and it wasn't really for anyone it wasn't like trying to get played on the radio or anything and then it did better than anything I'd ever done yeah and it was such a good healthy reminder of like it do, like it doesn't really matter about any of those things like just make something that's actually you believe in like so yeah so it not has that I didn't but you know what I mean like it was a yeah. very like conscious reminder of it yeah so will that change what you put out from now on that'll be more for you? Yeah, it has. Like, yeah. I've, because I've got like kind of libraries of uh, music, really. Like, my iTunes playlist the last few years is like enormous, but of just songs I've written and written with other people and things. But I think I'm a lot more, you know, I don't know. I only want to put things out that I, are things that I want to say now. Yeah. And like, even with Lanks coming back with a new song where I don't sing the lead vocal, to me, like, I just loved the song and I knew that it was something that I wanted to put out and say. Who sings the lead vocal? Um, there's a guy, Nick Hill, and then Geneva, this other girl who's amazing. They're both amazing. And I'm going to have to sing that part a little bit on the tour. I'm not playing it today because I haven't learned it yet. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could just butcher it, but it'll be terrible be okay. if I played it today. Um, but yeah, it's nice to like, yeah, just feel like it can be whatever I want it to be, I suppose, which is what it should have been. In. It is and it was in the first place. Yeah. Did That's, you know that they were going to sing these parts for you? Did you write it with them in mind? I wrote it with Nick originally. We are kind of writing for him and then it just never went anywhere. Like it just sat in a pile and I just kept coming back to it being like, the song's not really right yet. It's not done, but like I love this vibe and it feels like, it feels a bit like the two projects I've now got, like splitting myself, two solo projects. It's a bit night and day mm. to be very literal, but Lanx is like beatsy, like late at night, you know, like 
streets of New York a little bit, actually, Mm -hmm. which is like, I don't leave the house after like 10, so it's not really me, but um, no, it's just like, that's that side. And then the Lindsay thing feels like really nice to, I don't know, like little guitar ballads and things like that were things that didn't feel like they belonged in the Lanx world. So yeah, I guess it was nice to, um, it freed me up to give myself a second project where I didn't have to do that. Like the whole po- point of Lindsay for me was like not to overthink it. The first song's like, it was written and recorded in an hour and 20 minutes. Like, yeah, wow. And it's one of my favorite things I made last year. And it was recorded just singing into the laptop mic and all the guitar part, every part is just straight into the laptop. Yeah. And I've got like, even like I've got a new thing coming out really soon and I like have a really nice mic at home and I sang all the vocal parts into my phone, but it just sounds good. And it, What's that yeah, under? This... That's a new Lindsay thing as well. Lindsay, yeah. yeah coming out like next week. Because some people do reinvent themselves and, and use the same name and the same, yeah. Mm. I know there was the option of doing that, but I felt like I wanted to keep Lanks there to potentially do something like different and like... I guess Lindsay for me was the first time that I felt really certain of like exactly what I was doing. And like with Lanx, it's very like, it's my sketch pad. It's very exploratory. Like the, like there'll be a piano ballad and then the next song will be like real beats. And then the next song will be like completely different. But I feel like Lindsay is a chance for me to like have something that's a bit more cohesive as well. And so when you're writing, do you know which project you're writing for? Um, Yeah, a little bit. I haven't quite figured out yet how to, Right. Well, I think Lanx is very collaborative and Lindsay has a bit of that, but it's the first time I started writing on my own again is when the songs were, that were coming out were like Lindsay. Um, and I knew that that's why it has something different about it. Cause I was doing so much co-writing for like two years where I was like in the room with people like five days a week, writing yeah. songs for other people, some for me, whatever. And then I'd stopped writing songs for myself and on my own. And that's after doing that for like almost a year, I realized I wasn't enjoying it anymore. Yeah. Like just music in general. I have so many things I want to know. So I want to know about writing for other people. Is that, sure. do you have like briefs in mind? Do you know who you're writing for? Or are you just writing out songs and um, sending them out? To... I think that there's like a really low chance of a song going anywhere if I'm not with the person. Cause I love like people. So I really like to be with them in the room and really I don't think of it as like I think this is the key and why there's a lot of songs coming out that I've co-written like even the next year and stuff still. I think it's because my approach is I'm trying to help them make their best art, not trying to like put my own thing on it. Yeah, because so um, you've done collaborations with like – so that you're not even talking about collaborations, you're talking about writing specifically for other people. I think, yeah, a lot of the ones like features and stuff where I end up singing on someone else's track is because I was writing songs with them and then they were like, you know, I just sing there and I'm like, oh, let's, I'll just put this down just to, you know, see what it sounds, you know, and have some harmonies there. And then later on they've listened, they've got demoitis and they're like, oh, your voice does sound good on it. And I'm like, great, we can just leave it. It's fine. No. <laughs> It's a little bit like that. You're though. making yourself indispensable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a bit. It's a bit of that though. Like it might be like, yeah. I'm mostly. It's like you know, people. You organize a session. You're like, let's just sit down and make some music together. Yeah. And then I think it got at times. It got a little bit too like. It felt a bit clinical. Yeah. And that's when I realized it was like sapping my like inspiration a bit. And I was like, I'm in the room writing the same song every day. And then I was like, I just started saying no to everything. Last year, I said no to lots of things and I said yes to like a very small handful. And this year, I've done one session in two months, three, almost, no, two and a half months, whatever it is. And like, that's the smallest amount I would have done for four years or something. In a business sense, is there money in the co-writing? That's another wake up call. Like, it was really challenging. Like, um, not to like flex or anything, but I just had my first co-write as a gold record. Just happened like two oh, weeks ago. Oh, which was that? You should start name dropping because. Oh, okay. It was Strangers, Tia Gossello. Oh, yeah. And I sing on it as well. It's like a duet. Um, but like I'm interested in the business of music and the longevity of an artistic career because I want to make art for a long time. And co-writing is very challenging because mm. there's so many like cuts, like things get diluted. There's publishers, there's managers, there's co-writers. It's only you're not getting anything of the master, if anyone knows what I'm talking about. But No, um, it's important, yeah. Like I think there's uh, – it was really good to learn a lot and it was yep. great practice and it was an internship. Is so how do you, I do you bring it. like legal teams and um, contracts along? No, it's more like a 
like the whole Nashville thing is very much like even splits. Yeah. I, I'm sort of a long-term focused person. So I just kind of look at it as like, it's not worth fighting over. Usually if someone's like fighting you over percentages, it's mostly like over, you're fighting percentages of zero. So I don't get why, like there are people who might try and screw you over with publishing and then the song makes hardly anything and you're like, was that really worth having a fight over? It yeah. seems a bit bizarre to me. I kind of look at it as like you win some, you lose some. Yeah. Um, maybe at some point a song will go massive and I'll get like ripped out of it and then I'll be like, yeah, that wasn't as fun as I thought it would be. Yeah. Well, you know, it's worth. <laughs> and yeah. so on that note about, um, you know, percentages of no nothing, I'm curious because you're someone who's had like tens of millions of streams on your songs. How does what does that translate like? What does that actually mean in terms of like record sales, merch, people mm. at you know people at your shows? Do does, does those numbers because I can't quite fathom. Sure. Does that translate in a concrete way? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Like, um, I don't know who's listening to this stream, but um, I suppose I should just be like super upfront about things. Be um, candid. Great. I have trouble not being, but um, I I think there's like some serious flaws in the music industry business model but I'm also like someone who like I just like learning things so I dived pretty deep into like music business models over mm -hmm. the last couple of years and because I, I love doing what I do and I want to be able to do this for a long time but also I found it hard watching musicians spend like ten thousand dollars on a campaign and then everyone gets paid except for that person like and at the end of the day like Everyone says like, oh, it's so hard for the publicist. It's so hard for the this and the that. But like the publicist just got paid two grand for that campaign, whatever. And the musician like worked full time to try and fund that campaign. But ultimately, like I think people get told like you need to spend all this time and money on that one song. But I kind of think that really you should just make something good and then make something good and make something good and look at it in a really lean way. Like who wants to post every day of the year on social media? Like is that actually a good use of your time when you could go right? another 10 songs if you weren't doing that or like it's about efficiency in a non-robotic way like giving yourself time to be creative and giving yourself money to be creative mm. like if you're out there working full-time all the time how are you going to have time to be creative like so I don't know I've kind of changed I went and renegotiated with my label last year and I've changed my, all my setup and my deals and I just want to build a catalog of music and you're self-managed yeah well, with Lindsay, I'm kind of everything at the moment, like my own agent, my own manager. I've been like doing digital marketing. And Did you have to negotiate to set up a new project that was separate to Lanx with the label? Yeah, like it was pretty intimidating, but it was an amazing learning experience because I had to sit down there with like the heads of Unified, like with Jad and yeah. Comerford and these people. And I, had to, and I didn't go into it being like, I'm a musician and I want everyone to like give me a good deal. Like life's hard for me. I was like... Like, neither of us are getting what we both want out of this. I think there's a different way that this could work. Yeah. Um, stop me if I'm rambling and being boring or anything. But, yeah, I, that was the main thing. It was, like, you hear musicians all the time end up being quite bitter about things if it doesn't work or whatever. And I didn't want to feel like something was someone else's fault at the end of the day. I, and I just was, like, own it and learn from things. And if, the like, the setup of the deal doesn't make sense for me, like, there, was, there wasn't enough incentive to keep releasing under that deal. Yeah. But then also, like, they weren't making enough either because there was spend in certain areas that I, like, pretty big on. I'm pretty big on, like, evaluating whether something is contributing to it or not. The most important thing is a good song, but there's all these elements around it that, some people will tell you, like, you've got to do all these 100 things, but I'm more like the whole 80-20 rule of 20% achieves 80% result and then the other 80% probably achieves, you know what I mean, that sort of... Yeah, don't think it's boring because this is useful for a lot of people. No, so. it's cool. I, I think a lot about, like, yeah, what I think, like, young musicians and stuff should be doing. And I, I really think staying independent as possible and finding good distributor is yeah. a great idea. And I think people signed to labels because they think that they can't do something but actually like patience is the biggest issue that we all have yeah we think that we're ahead of where we are i did like we totally. all do and we think the reason it's not working is because we're not good enough um and and that someone else will solve the problem for us but i think it's not i don't really think that's often the way that it works and you got to analyze the label model is sign 30 people from a major perspective sign mm. 30 people and one of them will explode um, just because one will be great. And so that 
they can't give all 30 the attention. They don't have they don't have the resources to do that. And you most likely won't get the attention. Yeah. That's my view anyway. So I just want to ask you one more question and then <laughs> Sorry, I'm very listen. opinionated. No, no, this is doesn't exactly. doesn't apply to everything obviously. Yeah. Take everything with a grain of salt. Yeah. Like, but I'm I'd love to chat to people more about these things because I think that that's good for people to talk analytically and candidly about no, absolutely and it's super yeah. helpful but one yeah. thing that you are extremely good at is uh engaging with your audience and your fans and including people and um marketing and self-promotion and these things are like a real challenge for a lot of artists especially yeah. early stage just starting out i don't know if you remember but a, a long time ago you put a call out asking if people wanted to hear like a rough sketch of your music and I was like definitely and you sent it to me and it was just like but and I know you also set up like a secret group on Facebook called early Lanks secret sketch club secret sketch yeah and so and that group you know um was there as a kind of sounding board for you to be able to send ideas and people Mm -hmm. to give you feedback and you have all of these really creative and and you go, and you do live streams a lot on your Facebook page. Yeah, anyway, just you just dumb have, things, but yeah. It's, I don't think it's dumb. <laughs> I think it's actually genius. And oh, so, thanks. are there? Yeah, like just advice about yeah self promotion and marketing would be yeah incredibly um, helpful. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of like the idea of ideas that um, cut through a little bit. Like if something's too polished, I think it's often hard to engage with the humanness of it and the human behind it. Like, and I think in music, in the Australian music, like business model, it's like we make a song and put our song out like every quarter and we've like got the press release. We got the same person doing the press shots and we've spent $15,000 on a video and this is exactly how we do it. But like, you know, like why can't you just like just do something really different. Like, I don't know, put a song up, but only send it out via email or like, I just like talking about idea. like not every idea is good, but you know, like I'm kind of, because it's very easy for me to make songs with Lindsay, like it costs yeah. me, I just mix it myself. Like I'm terrible at mixing, but I just, my challenge is to make it all myself just for fun. But I'm some looking people at, are so yeah. attached to their idea, like their, you know, yeah. they don't want to put anything half baked out into yeah, the world because, you know, on the internet it just stays there forever and it yeah. has to be perfect. And But you obviously have a very different mindset, which is super, yeah. you know, which is incredibly helpful. I think it, it depends, like everyone's a different artist. Sorry. I feel like I'm touching on like a million different topics and not exploring any of them. It's, but, it's possibly because <laughs> um, there's a yeah. lot to Well, build, we, build yeah. Into. We went to the Keith Haring exhibition yesterday um, at the NGV and I felt like I really related and connected to them as artists in the way they work just like they – both him and Bas- I don't know how to Basket. say it. Basket. Basket. Uh, don't want to say it wrong. So, but they both like died quite young and had an incredible catalog of work. And I don't think they would have like released or whatever the really bad stuff, but they had an air of like, I did it here. It is move on to the next thing. Um, which like, I looked back on this recently and I was like, I have a catalog. Of, I started releasing really when I was like 24, 25 and I just turned 30 I've got a catalog of songs I've written and co-written that's about 50 to 60 songs already. And in the next year, I plan on making that more like 80 or something like, and it'll be like, I want to build a catalog of like 200 songs released sort of things. Bring it Um, on. So I think like, yeah, I don't know if I did it the way that like people often tell me to do it. I would never release more than like three singles a year. And, and what's this, what's a single anyway? Like what the formats of things like, I guess we look at everything as like we make art and then all these other platforms are there to promote the art and whatever. But why can't like your format of art, like if you make an amazing TikTok that's five seconds long, why can't that be a work of art? Like Mm -hmm. just as much as a single is. Um, So I'm just kind of like curious about medium. I'm curious about like what we're creating. I'm curious about looking at different models where I want to enjoy music now. So the idea of like not having... Not that I hate it or anything, just mm. I'm trying to find my center within it a bit more where I'm like making things with people that I love making things with. I'm taking all my own photos and I'm just using it to explore ideas myself. Yeah. And then I'm realizing that that feels really enjoyable to me to do it in this way. And I get it that like I'm also doing a hell of a lot of things that took me a long time to learn. So a lot of people might look at it and be really overwhelmed. But I'd kind of look at it and just say, what's the minimum that you have to do to just kind of keep 
incrementally building something and just focus on something like people really overestimate what you can achieve in a short time and underestimate what they can achieve in a long time like that that idea stands out to me like over five years with lengths i've had 30 plus million streams or something on spotify but it's just a slow build it's because i like the first ep nobody cared about really at all the second ep kind of was a little bit similar and then you know when i first like got added on the radio or whatever someone was like that's so unfair like i've been trying so hard and whatever and i was like i've played 102 length shows and this is my 10th single yeah like and it's the first time radio is like acknowledging it and to some extent it's like i don't i don't i don't really want to like build and my confidence and my life around like any of the things about external validation because it just makes me miserable when you don't get it. I know every single person who has social media would totally relate and understand right, absolutely. this. Absolutely. But I think I'm really happy when I'm like at home learning things and making things. So I just, I'm, tr- I'm really consciously designing what that life looks like and I'm trying to look at like that Venn diagram of like, what do I enjoy doing? What am I good at? What will someone pay me for, et cetera? And I'm just saying, well, what's like the sweet spot? Like, because there's a million things I would love doing and like, what allows me to do that with longevity and that's 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 the simple version of what i'm trying to build for myself i think we should wrap it up there so i could talk forever no please do not apologize i just could keep talking to you all day but uh pizza to eat beers to drink thank you so much for coming into small time we're going to hear a couple more songs are they going to be Lanks, Lindsay. I mean, I can play whatever. If anyone wants to mouth some like requests from the other side of the glass, you're welcome to. Everyone's like, don't know any of these songs, so that's no, they're like, they're just like, we will listen all day. Um, so. I might play like another new, like Lindsay song right. maybe, and then I'll play something that's already come out, but I don't know what it is yet. Great, thanks right. so much. That's right. Thanks for having me. I'll tune. Yeah. This guitar is freshly restrung, so if it goes out during a song, I'm really sorry. It's so nice to have a nylon string in the studio. I just, I love nylons. I got really into it um, when we were writing the OK Moon record. We had uh, my friend's Nan's guitar. There was like this $100 guitar from like the 70s or something. Yeah. And um, it was, it's not like a, a good guitar it just has character I mean it's not like bad but you know what I mean it's, yeah it's, totally you wouldn't have paid, you would have paid very little for it and it ended up being like the driver of the album like for OK Moon we wrote Crater on the Moon which is like our biggest song now and we wrote Harpoon and a bunch of songs all on this one guitar yeah I'm a really big believer in like instruments can kind of draw things out of you whose guitar is it um my friend Jess who always like would play in the Lanx live show it's her it was her nan so um yeah we re-recorded some parts because like it was just the intonation on it was like rubbish but um but yeah Crater on the Moon is all just that one guitar it's just yeah I don't know stuff like that where like really music doesn't have to be expensive either yeah and absolutely it, that sounds a bit like privileged as well so people might you know probably fair enough but I think a lot of the time we think we need to like go you know someone emailed me the other day and sent me some like demos and they were like yeah I'm going to the studio and blah blah to record these soon and I listened to them I was like I don't really think you should touch these like it just sounded amazing anyway sorry I'm just talking great Uh, I'm gonna play a song called Rituals
sideways for some guidance. We're always looking 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 sideways for some guidance. First time I've played that one before for anyone. It's a keeper. Thanks. Um, I'm not actually quite sure what like last song to play. Um, is there actually any way someone could tell me what to play? Please don't be the new length song though, because that'd struggle. I don't know what she said. I don't know what she said either. Sounds. Oh, like strangers. A... Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, yeah, you got it. I've actually recorded a very different version of this that without a big capo I can't play today, but it's coming out next week. Um, What's a big capo? As in like, because it's nylon, it's got a bit of a bigger neck. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You just yeah. need like one of the, the classical longer. ones, yeah. yeah. But it's like up here and it's, yeah, it's pretty wild. But I'll just play the the normal version of it. Um, let me just remember how this goes. Summers through the winter sky Photograph me in my wild The times that we romanticized See the wire Watch the moon Sink lightly into your glow With the lights out Two bodies where we flow We were strangers wandering home we were strangers We were strangers We were strangers That I just paralyzed. See the wire, watch the moon sink lightly into your glow. With the lights up, two bodies where we float. We were strangers wandering on. We were strangers. We were strangers.
That was stunning. Thank you so much. Thanks. For coming in. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. So great. I haven't played for anyone for a little while. Just. It's been like five months. So that's beautiful. Weird. So thank you for coming in. Uh, thanks for coming back to Australia. You're playing some shows. Actually, I'm having a look. Pretty much all capital cities. You're heading to Adelaide. Uh, you're, oh, you're even going to the west. You're heading to Frio. That's right. Sydney, Brisbane. Yeah. And then two Melbourne shows, one of which is already sold out. Yes. So check your calendars through March. Lanx is around and then you're heading back to the States. Yep. I'm also playing Melbourne and Sydney for Lindsay as well. They happen okay. to be like two days off for each, so I'm doing all of them. Amazing. Yeah. I will yeah. definitely see you at one of each. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So thanks again for coming in. No worries. Uh, you've been watching Lanx, Lindsay, Will Coming uh, live on Small Time TV. Thanks for tuning in.